Today, I'll be talking about using a hidden Markov model to remove pseudogenes from CO1 metabarcodes. I'm currently working with the STREAM project. We are sequencing the rivers for environmental assessment and monitoring. This is a Canada-wide community-based monitoring project. One of the features is rapid turnaround and increased throughput of freshwater samples. And one of the goals is to validate DNA metabarcoding for generating biodiversity data for benthic macroinvertebrates. So the method we're using to collect data is DNA metabarcoding. This is also known as amplicon uh, gene sequencing or marker gene sequencing in the literature. And what we do is we collect freshwater macroinvertebrates from the bottom of riverbeds. These samples are homogenized. Community genomic DNA is extracted and the DNA barcoding region of interest is amplified using PCR. And the composition of the original community is determined by comparing our sequences with a reference sequence database. So there are a number of pipelines currently available for handling amplicon sequencing data, but they were all primarily developed to process ribosomal RNA gene markers. Now in this project, we're actually working with a protein coding gene called cytochrome oxidase subunit one, also known as CO1. This is a mitochondrial gene, and the five prime end of this gene is being used as the official animal barcode marker, showing the DNA barcoding region in blue. And in this project, we're using CO1 metabarcoding. So we're targeting um, smaller subsections of the barcoding region, and that's shown in red. And those regions are sequenced on an Illumina MySeq platform. The challenge with this approach is that the primers that we use for PCR to amplify CO1, they also amplify pseudogenes. So a pseudogene is a copy of a gene that is non-functional. And when a mitochondrial portion of a, this gene is moved into the nuclear genome, this is referred to as a NUMPT. That stands for Nuclear Encoded Mitochondrial DNA Segment. And these sequences are easy to spot if they result in a truncated sequence due to a frame shift mutation or a premature stop codon. If we don't remove these pseudogenes, this can result in inflated richness estimates at the species or haplotype level, inflated measures of phylogenetic diversity, and misleading phylogenetic branching patterns. So the objective of this project then is to introduce a pseudogene filtering step to help reduce noise in metabarcoding data sets that use protein coding markers. Our pipeline is called MetaWorks, and it's suitable for processing Illumina sequencing ribosomal RNA markers, ITS. And what makes this new is it's also suitable for processing protein coding markers. It uses a snake make workflow, and the steps are pretty standard in the field. But what's new is the branch on the right in green. And this is where we remove putative pseudogenes. We do this doing um, with two different methods. The first method uses a program called ORF Finder. An ORF is an open reading frame. And what this program does is it takes a CO1 gene sequence and it will translate it into every possible open reading frame. The only one we're interested in is the longest one highlighted at the top here. And we record the length of that open reading frame. The second method we use to try to find pseudogenes is a program called Hummer. Um, and HMM stands for a Hidden Markov Model, and the program Hummer can help you to build and use those HMMs for searching. A hidden Markov Model can be used to describe features in groups of related biological sequencing sequences. And what I'm showing here is a multiple sequence alignment where each column of the alignment can exist in either a match, delete, or insert state in the simplified model that I show below. Each state is associated with its own set of emission probabilities, which I'm showing in the table on the right. And this is basically equivalent to the frequency of each residue in a particular column of the alignment. There are also transition probabilities, which are associated with moving from one state to the next across the alignment and that is shown by the arrows. This is encoded into the profile 
and the probabilities are stored as negative natural logarithms. I built a custom CO1 barcode HMM profile while retrieving 2.4 million sequences from the bold data releases. I reduced the data set by clustering with 80% sequence similarity to reduce the data set to about 6,000 reference sequences. These sequences were translated into open reading frames and the amino acid sequences were aligned and then used with Hummer to create the profile. I used this profile while taking a FASTA file of my CO1 meta barcode sequences and translating them into open reading frames and comparing each of the amino acid ORFs with the profile in Hummer, retrieving the bit score. The bit score is a log odds ratio score and it is the likelihood of the query given the model to the likelihood of the query given a random sequence model. Once I have this information in hand, I can plot a distribution so that I can calculate cutoffs. In this figure, um, the teal colored bars are simulated nums and the coral colored bars are genes. And on the x-axis, I would show either the distribution of ORF lengths or Hummer bit scores. And you can see where I've indicated the lower outlier cutoff and the upper outlier cutoff. And any values that fall at the ends of this distribution would then be removed as putative pseudogenes. We validated our method by creating perturbed community data sets. And what I did is I retrieved 100,000 CO1 gene sequences from BOLD, and I simulated NUMS using two different methods. The first method was to introduce GC to AT point mutations to reduce the GC content of simulated NUMS. The second method was to introduce indels to cause frame shift mutations. I also created four different kinds of community data sets. The first kind was based on full length CO1 barcode sequences with simulated NUMS. The second data set was comprised of short sequences closer to what we would expect when we work with meta barcode data. The third set contained twice as many NUMS and the fourth set contained half as many NUMS. This is um, the kind of comparisons that we would carry out. So we can compare the distributions um, using two different kinds of pseudogene removal and pseudogenes that were created using two different mutation methods. This is a summary of all of that data. In this figure, sensitivity refers to our ability to correctly remove pseudogenes and specificity refers to our ability to retain gene sequences. And so what I'd like to point out is across all of our perturbed community data sets, specificity was very high, but sensitivity was low when the pseudogenes only contained GC to AT mutations. It was also harder to filter out these pseudogenes if they were very short or if they were very prevalent in the data set. We also tested our pipeline on a real freshwater CO1 meta barcode um, data set. This data set used um, six different uh, primer sets and we recorded the number of NUMPs that we were able to screen out. And so in this example here with the FWH1 amplicons, we were able to remove 5% of our exact sequence variants using our pipeline. And we took it a step further. Instead of just running the standard pipeline, we also started to sequentially remove some of the filtering steps in a normal pipeline to see what effect that would have on the number of numps that we could remove. And what we found is if we skipped the rare sequence removal step, we were able to recover a lot more NUMPs. And so what that means for me is that in existing bioinformatic pipelines, we're already removing a lot of these artifactual sequences, including NUMPs. But as you can see from the table above, using our pipeline, we can remove a few more. So the take home message is that HMM profile analysis can be used to remove obvious pseudogenes. We did find it harder to remove pseudogenes when the prevalence of pseudogenes in the data set is high, when their sequence length is short, or if they only contain GC to AT point mutations. Our pipeline can remove up to 5% of sequences even when other filtering steps are in place. 
And this method will likely become more effective at removing pseudogenes as technical methods evolve to produce longer metabarcodes. Thank you.